our hearts in a new way today. May uh, we gain a lesson we didn't expect today, but one that we might find uh, pertains in large ways and small. Amen. I want to begin with a reminiscence uh, by jo Joanne Rowley of Englewood, Colorado. Um, see if this doesn't resonate with you. She says, as a girl 35 years ago, I was idealistic, energetic, imaginative, and uncompromising in my convictions. My heart went out to the poor, the oppressed, the suffering in body or spirit. I fought for civil rights, prayed for world peace, donated my lunch money to help stop the clubbing of baby seals. But now after two divorces, raising a daughter, and years of trying to balance work and home life, I am too tired to notice what needs fixing in the world and too disillusioned to believe it can be fixed anyway. I rarely read the paper. Ignorance is bliss has become my motto. But where is that young girl with her lofty ideals? Where did she lose her way? Well, I'm sad to say that Joanne's story is, is not a rare one at all. Uh, a lot of people have their youthful idealism bled out of them, right? They, or, or maybe I should say we, <laughs> we become so tired uh, and this, of course, is known today as compassion fatigue, right? Compassion fatigue. And I'm sure you know what I mean, because millions and millions of good people are feeling it right now. So in this morning's text, uh, the young disciples of Jesus are about to go out two by two to announce uh, that God's uh, kingdom, God's reign, God's way of doing things has arrived is fully present in the world, uh, that no one needs to stand waiting for some chariot from God to come from the clouds. No, no, Jesus is present and he's the real deal. No one needs to wait to hear a thunderclap that will announce that Roman rule in Palestine is over. Rome is strong, but its power will eventually collapse under its own imperial weight. That's the way with empires. It's clear to these followers that God's power is present and abundant in the message and healing power and absolute, wonderful, unique love of Jesus. This Palestinian peasant, this man named Jesus, may seem to the naked eye to look kind of puny, uh, but the power of God's message through him uh, looks to his idealistic friends like it's going to last forever. But Jesus knows that his is uh, not going to be a message many people are going to be prepared to understand. Uh, Jesus is worried that his young cohort will lose their enthusiasm pretty quickly under the sarcasm and disdain of those that they preach to. He seems worried that they, they might, in fact, oversell it. I mean, his message is so simple, it's so unadorned, <clears throat> and it calls for a simple, unadorned delivery. It calls for a maximum integrity from the message givers first. So Jesus has the following advice for these uh, 72 young people who are going to carry it. He says, when you go out now to tell people about the, the reign of God, for heaven's sake, don't take a lot of baggage. Just go with your carry-on. Depend on the hospitality of those who welcome you. And when you go, don't move from house to house looking for the best place in town, saying things like, boy, the McGillicuddy's beds are hard. We should spend the morning looking for someplace better. No, he says, stay where you are with whoever takes you in because I don't want anybody to get the impression that you're comparing members of that community favorably or unfavorably with other members according to their means, especially. Don't leave a small town in disarray when you go to the next one. So Jesus is inferring that what is set before these fellows to eat uh, 
will sometimes be kosher food and sometimes Gentile food. He's saying, don't reject anything that people put in front of you because I don't want anyone to think we make, you know, ethnic distinctions before God. I, I, I don't want, I, I want you to make clear that everybody, whether they feed you out of their food stamp allowance, right, or whether they entertain 30 guests every night with takeaway from McCormick and Schmicks, uh, it's all the same and act like it's all the same, okay? That's his point. And then he says, I want you to announce to them the following, that the reign of God is here. That's the good news, and it's simple. God's love and grace is present in the person of Jesus himself. It's not on its way. No, it's here. There's been no mistake. This is the world God wanted everyone to be born into, no matter what the world's dire circumstances look like. God's busy, patiently working God's will out in everyone's lives through the events as they present themselves. So Jesus knows this is the hardest lesson for a lot of people to get. I mean, most think there's been a mistake and that they need to be tons richer or healthier or more beautiful or more talented before anything good or worthwhile can happen to the world through them. Some take almost a lifetime to learn this lesson. Some, sadly, never learn it at all, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. And so Jesus levels with them. You will go into some places where they will reject you. You will not be welcome. Some days you will receive no hospitality, nothing to eat, nothing. Well, they ask, what are we going to do then? Jesus says, follow the ancient pattern. Shake the dust off your sandals. Not in anger, just perfunctorily. Just like you do when you're putting your sandals on every morning sitting on your doorstep, just shake them out. And by doing this, you'll be saying without words, I leave you all to God. I'll let you figure it out on your own. But listen, whatever you do, don't fuss at the people, he says to his disciples. Don't fuss at them. Don't be condescending. Then someone asks him, well, what if they say no to the message? Now, this is the important part. Uh, this is where the broken down, worn out spirit of Joanne, a story I told you in the beginning, uh, comes in. Jesus says, it's not up to you to get anybody to say yes or no, for that matter. How they respond to the message of the presence of the reign of God is not your business. And if they don't get it, it's not your fault. Leave everything to the Spirit of God. Just give them the good news that God's kingdom is present and alive, just as everything is, and whether they accept what you say or call you an idiot, let your demeanor about it be the same. Either way, you need not worry about the outcome. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. You know, Mother Teresa once said, we are not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. God oversees the rest. There's a wonderful Jewish tradition that, that shines a steady light on this truth. Um, it goes this way. It says this. It says, there are 36 righteous people in every generation. Every generation. 36. And on them, the salvation of the world depends just 36, and, and everything depends on them. They are quiet, unassuming, and don't even know they're part of the 36. If someone says they're part of the 36, they are not. That's how you can identify them. They think they're part of it. No, they're not. At some point in their lives, the genuine ones are called upon to do their good work. They do it quietly, without attention to themselves, and then just as quietly, they disappear. They are not the Mother Teresas of the world because we know who she is. These are nameless folk, almost nameless. They, if you learn their name, you will forget it next week. They live to do their one needful thing 
at that one pregnant moment they were born to stand up and say something in. Then they disappear. They don't even have to be especially gifted. They just need to witness to the truth at that one moment as they understand it because everything is prepared before for them to do just that. If you were watching the surprise January 6th hearing on Thursday, Cassidy Hutchison may be just such, just such a person, one of the 36, who knows? So here is what Jesus wants those who follow him to say to folks wondering about God's workings. Just say, the reign of God is here on earth, working quietly, mysteriously, under everyone's radar. You will never understand its ways, and you don't have to understand those ways to be a tiny bit of a part of it. And this is good news for two reasons. Because you never have to worry whether you've done a good job or not. And secondly, you don't have to explain how it all works to anyone. Jesus says, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that your message, your life, your behavior, your relationships don't need to be determined by other people. So don't react to them. Don't react in anger or disgust or resentment. Just deliver the message as you know it. Be yourself whether they say yes or no is not the point. You are to be children of God. Remember my teaching, he says. If you only speak nicely to those who speak nicely to you, what is that? And if you only offer hospitality to those who offer it to you, what's the point? If you're only generous to those who are generous to you, big deal. It's not the economy of God. That's the economy of human beings. You are to act as God would act. And yes, that's a tall order, but it's what you are to do, and you know it's simpler that way. Because God is simply love. Remember, God sends the nourishing rain on the just and the unjust at the same time. All of Portland gets covered. And you should act that way too. If someone won't hear you out or spit in your face, just move on and say, the kingdom of God is here in this place. I know, I know, it's hard to see. Now, this is a difficult teaching, for sure, I admit that. But it is Jesus' teaching. And as such, it's simple and also deep. Do not react to anybody's behavior, he says. Do not react right, to anyone's behavior. Instead, just be yourself no matter what. As God acts out of God's character, you act out of yours. Because here's the deal about reacting. When you are reactive, you are letting other people dictate the situation. First realize that. That's the most important part of this. You realize what you're doing. And then commit yourself to be alert to it. And stop the habitual cycle of them doing something that pushes your button and you automatically reacting. Just be yourself, he says. Carry no baggage. Have no agenda. You don't need to puff yourself up bigger than life or humble yourself down so you're small and wincing. Stand at your true height and deliver your life's message, whatever it is, as is. No apologies, no apologies, and no, no hype at all. And you know, I bet that sometime in your life, the best advice you ever got, right, was this kind of advice, the same advice that Jesus gave the 72. You don't need 10 sets of clothes or an attorney, or a parachute. You don't even need to carry a flashlight. Sometimes to do the most important thing you've been put on earth to do, whatever it is, all you need is standard issue you. Right? You. 
You will just need to be yourself. Anything added will just take away from what you have to offer. What I'm saying is that God didn't make a mistake when you were made to fulfill your mission in this life. You have everything you need. You know, nine times out of ten, people mess up because they are too busy looking around at other people, comparing themselves unfavorably to someone else. Imagine yourself as a runner in a race. If, if you are constantly thinking about your opponents and how you stack up against them, you will be defeated before you begin. But if you run because running is what you love to do, you'll do your best every time. Look at the birds of the air. They fly with such abandon and precision, right? They fly through massive trees, dense with leaves in summer, and they never run into a branch, right? They land on limbs with apparently no effort. They never think, oh, God, I'm up here so high, I could fall. And again, this takes waking up, realizing where you are prone to merely react to other people or specific situations. You have to wake up to take back your natural poise. Well, here's a simple but also profound reflection on waking up. Uh, it's from a piece in the New York Times by, by Mary Laura Philpott, and I'm going to close with it. She says, when we become adults, we lose the prompt to reboot our lives every fall. But we don't have to. When I was in elementary school, a classmate of mine once returned to campus in September to announce that henceforth she would be going by her middle name, Goodbye Megan, Hello Jules. Her friend spent a week quizzing her about her choice and then moved on. It was a new school year. Everyone was starting over. Someone had a new haircut and pierced ears. Someone got glasses. Someone stopped playing soccer and joined the band. Someone switched lunch, lunch tables, fr switched friends. Big deal. I'm jealous of my childhood self now, she says, when I remember that every fall we got to start over, as if our lives were getting a routine software upgrade. I cleaned out my book bag, tossed old notebooks, lined up fresh pencils, got my feet measured for new shoes, and showed up to school ready to learn. I bemoaned the end of summer, but I also loved the sense of possibility a new grade held. Mystery and possibility don't come calling for us so often in adulthood. When we get out of school, we lose that annual prompt for reinvention, and I miss it, she says. Without that automatic opportunity to reintroduce ourselves to the world, we, we get a chance at a reboot only if we manufacture it. So I've decided I'm going to look at this fall as if I'm starting the next level in school. If I pick up where I left off, that would put me in, please hold on while I count my fingers, 40th grade. <laughs> I'm not the only one I know with plans to mix things up this fall. There's something about that time of year, even this far removed from our student days, that signals a fresh start. One of my friends, she'd be in her 42nd grade now, it's taking the new school year, new me concept literally, starting classes at the same time as her elementary schoolers. Step one of a plan to earn her master's degree and change careers. A friend in 39th grade is finally starting therapy, committed to figuring out whether it's time to end a relationship that doesn't seem to be working for her anymore. I'm starting 40th grade by changing how I allocate my time. First, I'm setting my alarm 12 minutes earlier, downloading the Calm app, and adding guided meditation to my mornings before I start responding and reacting to various stimuli. I want to begin the day on my own terms in peace. Second, I've cut back my hours at my day job 
meaning I'll be able to sit down, write down to my writing most days instead of opening work email first. Will meditating for a few minutes help me take a more serene approach to life? Will I get more work done on my new schedule? Or with less regular income and more solitude, will I go broke and or insane? In 40th grade, I will find out. It's sometimes the hardest work in life is learning the lesson Jesus tried so hard to teach his friends. It was simply to learn to be themselves. So we're going to sing our hymn of response. Number 669. You are welcome to sing this in Spanish if you are brave and English 